Hi everyone, I'm Juliet Reyes. You may have remembered me from the Europe lecture in IR, um, but today um, after all that fun stuff, um, we're gonna talk about war. What takes the round from O to O damn. Right, so work with me. Cool, so before we continue, I wanna ask that rhetorical question. What is war? Like, we perceive it as a conflict, right? But many different scholars, analysts, and political commentators would argue that war can really vary on definition. So for the sake of this presentation, I am going to provide a general hybrid definition, if you will. So, according to Oxford Dictionaries, War is a state of armed conflict between different countries or different groups within a country. So this expands the generic definition of war from beyond country versus country. It can be multiple countries. It can even be just groups of people against a country or groups of people within a country not even fighting over the country, just each other. This essentially gives war a new meaning. Also, a state of armed conflict. Arms, as we're going to learn today in this lecture, vary on definition and means and way that they are executed. So the first one, conventional war, your standard armed conflicts and storybook revolutions. And yes, I will be using a lot of world ball memes and Avengers references because that's the way we roll here. So let's get on with it. Conventional war. Conventional wars are typically fought exclusively with arms, tanks, submarines, and other standard military equipment. They are typically fought between two countries with few allies. According to the Small Wars Journal, what separates conventional wars from other forms of warfare is a strict adherence to structural norms of the time. So essentially what they're saying is for me to go fighting with bayonets back in the Revolutionary War is conventional warfare because that was the main weapon at the time. However, if I were to go still fight with bayonets today, it wouldn't be considered conventional warfare even though it previously was. Why? Because bayonets are not the conventional means of arms of today in 2019. Examples of conventional warfare are the Revolutionary War, World War II, and the Iraq War. Modern day examples include the Afghanistan War and the Yemeni War. A small tip, wars can have more than one type. So these are oftentimes called hybrid wars or just your regular war, to be honest. War is not defined within a barrier. It actually is just a representation of human nature and conflict that really can be analyzed through multiple dimensions. So let's move on. Civil and ethnic wars. I think the best ethnic war is between cats and dogs. That shit's intense. Pardon my language. Um, but Captain America Civil War is a hyperbole but funny example of what a civil war could look like. Um, however, my definition for civil ethnic wars are a little different than most. Oh, by the way. This is a good representation of what is known as a civil war. So for context, China had a communist revolution back in um, around World War II. And the previous government, which is now modern day Taiwan, broke away and said it was its own country. But even today, China considers it a part of its own. And this little funny meme kind of explains the joke. Right, civil ethnic wars. I do know that sometimes a civil war can be different from an ethnic war. However, the same principles that cause these conflicts are the same. So that's why I put them together. So first part, ethnic war. This is a civil war too, but a conflict that is fought within two or more groups in a state or conflict typically between two or more different ethnic identities. These wars are typically most deadly because of zealous idealistic motivations and the cost of losing is extremely expensive. I want to pause on that. The reason why I say that these wars in particular are the most zealous and idealistic is because the only motivation that one would have to fight against their own country 
or to target a group within their own country is because they believe that they have some mandate from above or within their own righteous zeal to go and correct the wrongs of the country and create a new order. This is what we saw with the Civil War when the Confederates broke away from the United States, and this is what we saw in the Sudan Civil War when South Sudan broke away because they wanted to be their own country, but Sudan, which was majority Muslim, felt as though it was their religious duty to bring back South Sudan and not let them leave. So for that reason, it's deadly. But the other reason why it's deadly and the cost of losing is expensive is because in conventional warfare, the international community is prepared to help nations resolve conflict. But when the winning party of a civil war is now that nation, the losing party is easily labeled as a terrorist group or an insurgency group, a militant group, an autonomous region, a group that has no geopolitical legitimacy. So not only are they going to be punished by the winning party, but they're also not going to receive any aid from the international community that other losers in typical wars would typically get. So this is something very important to notice. Um, examples that from history of civil ethnic wars are the American Civil War, the French Revolution, the Korean War, the Chinese Communist Revolution, and the Sudanese War. Modern day examples include the Syrian Civil War, the Yemeni War, and the Pakistan Indian conflict. We'll explain more about that war later. A big tip is that tribalism is actually a big motivating factor for these conflicts. Tribalism, in short, was created by Amy Chua, a Yale Law professor, and it's the idea that we identify ourselves with a group, whether it be a political group, an ethnic group, a social group, it doesn't matter, as long as it's a group or more, and thus, we view people based on what groups they identify with. So, take, for example, Trump, right? He views Republicans as good, but when no one really fits into his identical belief of what a Republican is, he'll then immediately call them a Democrat, because he believes that's the rival group, the group that they have to beat. Tribalism is very deadly and oftentimes has been the resulter in massive genocide. Innovative wars. So this is where the term air actually becomes relevant. Congratulations, sci-fi people. You have your moment in debate for once. Um, innovative wars are specifically when a conflict or new technologies, strategies, and means rules of combat are introduced. This is the opposite of a conventional war. Conventional war is where we're just using what we have. But an innovative war is we're using new stuff. Um, these wars are more rhetorical than deadly, interestingly enough. Because parties are more so just flaunting their innovations in hopes the enemy will surrender. However, when a party does become serious and actually implements said threats, <clears throat> Hiroshima, the cost of human life is expensive. I think the best example of this is World War II. I actually made a mistake. World War II, I'd say, actually... World War II, what's interesting about World War II is in the beginning, it was a conventional war, and then it became an innovative war as more people started utilizing new technologies. So in that case, I will say that in, in that particular case, it would work. If someone is confused with that definition, please let me know. I will explain it as best as I can. Um, well, but really, when we look at modern day examples of innovative wars is the North Korean conflict. They are trying to come up with new chemical weapons. Um, the war against ISIS and terrorism in general has also been using new means of combat, different more evolved forms of guerrilla warfare, chemical weapons, bioweapons, makeshift nuke weapons have been used by India and Kashmir. And Russia and the Ukraine, they're coming up with new ships every single day. They are fighting to win it. Um, these innovative wars, however, oftentimes don't result in mass death because people are like, wow, I'm so scared. I don't want you to hurt me. I just want to gain geopolitical power. However, if you do have an actor that is willing to use it, such as when the U.S. used nuclear bombs in Hiroshima, then the cost is deadly and really questions the humanity of the military that just executed that attack. Um, but now that we've had fun with nukes, we'll come back to them later, proxy wars. 
Because actually, fighting wars is just for plebeians. So, proxy wars are actually the most common type of warfare in 2019. They weren't common back in history, but today they are now becoming more prominent than ever. So let's take a look. Basically, a proxy war is a conflict where two or more outside actors use an already existing conflict to gain dominance or hegemony. These wars are more common in the modern area of geopolitics and are mostly fought between superpowers. In fact, proxy wars are one of the leading causes of terrorism. So when I say the leading cause of terrorism, I'm not just saying, yeah, if you have a proxy war, terrorists will come out of nowhere. No. I will bring two examples here. The Vietnam War and the Iraq War. In the Vietnam War, the United States was fighting an essential proxy war against Russia, where while Vietnam was fighting against communists in its own country, Russia and the U.S. were taking advantage of this conflict to really promote their Cold War that was currently going on. Um, in the essence, though, as the U.S. and Russia were laying waste to all of the land here, um, eventually the winning of the communists resulted in what was known as the Khmer Rouge, a communist terrorist organization within Cambodia, a neighboring country to Vietnam that eventually took over Cambodia and enlisted years of terror until they were finally dethroned. This terror organization wasn't just immediately inspired by the war, they saw the losses of the war. And when the communists won, they felt as though they had run their right to run communism all across Southeast Asia. As we can see, this is very deadly. But what happens when the terror side loses? Well, that's where I go to the Iraq War. In the Iraq War that recently ended in around 2016, because let's be honest, ISIS coming in 2014 only extended it, um, after the U.S. killed Saddam Hussein, Saddam Hussein, it's important to note, was a Sunni Muslim. And the thing about Iraq that's interesting is that it's a Shia-majority country. So what Saddam Hussein would do was that he would abuse the Shia Muslims, and at the same time, he would then go and promote Sunni Muslims into high-ranking positions that some of them didn't deserve. This resulted in ethnic cleansing and mass corruption and failed bureaucracy. But after Saddam Hussein was taken out, all of the government that existed was also removed from office by the United States, and they put in Shia leaders because they wanted to even the playing field. Well, this was a really dumb move on the United States, because those Sunni leaders who had access to money, military arms, expertise, and skills, then formed what they now know today as the Islamic State. And they spread all across the Middle East. People say the ISIS is dead right now, but what they don't realize is that once a terrorist organization forms and spreads an ideology to the power that ISIS has, that organization will never die. Its ideology may take on different forms, but it will always thrive, and it will, at times, destabilize countries. And that's why, when we talk about these things in debate, we need to be careful. We can't use zero-sum terms when talking about foreign policy and war. It never works. Foreign policy and people in general are just changing. They're moving actors. Um, so yeah, uh, sorry for my rant there, but now let's look at some historical examples of proxy wars. So, the Cold War, no duh, um, the Syrian Civil War, the Yemeni War, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. In short, if you really are still confused about proxy wars, it's a war within a war. Right? Like, we're fighting a war with Russia in Syria. The more that we, we were, we're not necessarily just fighting because we feel bad for the Syrians. Sadly, I hate to say it, we're fighting because we don't want Russia taking over the country. That's it. Um, but moving on to the final means of warfare. Trade wars. And you all thought it couldn't get worse. Well, it turns out trade wars are actually a form of warfare. Remember when I said that arms can vary? Yeah, they vary a lot. So. A trade war is a conflict fought with economic means and strategies such as tariffs, counter-trade agreements, infrastructure initiatives, and general soft power. These wars are more common in the modern era of geopolitics and are mostly fought between superpowers and regional groups. What I mean by this is not one country, unless they're a superpower, can fight in a trade war. Like, for example, the European Union can wage a trade war because they're a region and conglomerate of people. 
they have money and power. And for example, the African Union, the AFCTA, if it does succeed with its regional bloc, or heck, even ECOWAS, another regional bloc in Western Africa, if they want to start a trade war, they could because they have that combined power. It's very rare to see a superpower really engage in a trade war. Honestly, not even Russia could do it. Russia would most likely have to do it through its Eurasian Economic Union. I would say now that the only two countries who are really capable of doing a trade war just on their own is China and the United States. Um, but moving on from that, trade wars and geoeconomic conflicts have been utilized since the Cold War. So in the book, War by Other Means, which I highly recommend for anyone watching this presentation, is a book that basically says that ever since the Cold War, when the U.S. wanted to use soft power to gain over European countries that were going to the specter of communism, they used international aid and infrastructure projects to bring them over to the side of capitalism and Western ideals. Essentially, it's a very long-winded project, but geoeconomics, as it is called more formally today, is a big part of warfare. It is essentially the way that you can win a war without having sustained loss. If I had to pick, like if I was a country and I had to pick the two main things of warfare that I would use, I would most likely do a trade war and an innovative war. Because those wars, I wouldn't really actually have to fight. I'd be able to take out their economy while at the same time coming up with new technology that would defend my people even if my side is losing elsewhere in a proxy war. So keep these things in mind as you're debating. These five types of warfare can all vary in different areas. Sometimes conventional warfare is better because you don't maybe not have the money or alliance to conduct a trade war, but you do have the money to take out a criminal syndicate or to bring down an insurgency in your developing country, right? Sometimes conventional war, I hate to say it, can work. But as we've learned today, war evolves. The idea of using leverage and conflict to achieve a means is not it. But the way that we do this is in constant motion. So think of it a little bit like atoms, guys. Like atoms are always moving in our body. Our brain is always working. War is the same way. I like to connect war to anthropology, the study of humanity, because war is just in itself a reflection of the worst, yet the brightest of human society. It really shows how far we're willing to critically think, but it also shows how far we will be selfish to gain what we want. Which leads us to the next slide. So what starts a war? We know what a war is. We know different types of war. But how does it start? Well, as Gordon Ramsay would tell you in the lovely photo showed above, Sometimes resources start wars. Um, my formula personally in debate has been the, three, uh, the main four strategies. Military tensions, basically a good example is the South China Sea or Kashmir, right? If you have troops and you have military equipment near someone else's border or territory, that's going to be a concern. That alone may not start a war unless you conduct an accidental strike, but even nowadays we have international organizations to bypass those effects. Um, but still, like, uh, it's very low that just military tensions alone will start a war. Like, North Korea is a good example. North Korea has a bunch of nukes, and they're right next to South Korea. They are technically still in the war, but they haven't really gone to conflict. Like... It's a pretty tense situation, but just military equipment alone isn't going to cause someone to go at your border and really just go burning down your houses. It's a combination, really. Um, the second factor is nationalist and tribalist forever. And I'm going back to that ideal of nationalism and tribalism. So let's say um, you're a country and you're Christian, right? You're Christian. You're all good, and you're next to another country that's Muslim. And let's say you guys are radical Christians. You are nationalist, tribalist Christians. You believe that Christianity is the only religion that deserves to exist. It is by the will of God that you have to exterminate everyone and any for everyone that is not Christian. Well then, that would be a good motivating factor to go to war. Yeah, and if we add in the first ingredient of, let's say, that country has a lot of good military tech and it's stationed at its border, well, 
you're going to do the same thing. But that nationalist and tribalist forever would be enough to push you to maybe do an attack or two, or an insurgency. But not necessarily enough to go for a right-out invasion, right? So we're building up the pot. Now let's look at great economics with a dash of zealism. So when I say great economics, I don't mean the country actually has money. I mean the people and the country perceives itself to have money. Like Russia doesn't have money, but Russia in itself does perceive to be very rich. So let's say, let's go back to our Christian country, right? Our Christian country is going to declare war. It has military tensions, nationalist forever, but it's not there yet, right? Well, if you don't have anything to lose in this war, right? Like if, you know, you go and everyone thinks your economy is good, you don't have the burden of, oh, we have to stay and put the money in our schools, right? This is oftentimes what have justified the U.S.'s intervention because the U.S. has so much money, even though we also have a lot of debt, but we justify, we have the money, we can go and do this. And it's kind of like our job as a superpower, right? It's that zeal that comes with either perceiving to have money or actually having money. Um, and then the final ingredient, I would say, is... A either desire for resources or a lack of resources. This is the tipping point, I think. Um, so let's go back to our Christian country, right? Um, they have military tensions. They're very tribalist. And they have a good portfolio on the surface. Like, they're getting in a good GDP every year. Now, let's say the other country has a lot and lot of oil, right? That country has a lot of oil. This country, the Christian country, doesn't have that much. Like, it has, like, a region or two that can produce oil, but it really wants oil. Well, all the check boxes are marked. You have the military equipment. You have the motivation to do it. Your economics even supports you going in there and fighting. And you have the perfect thing to weigh off the costs. Well, ladies and gentlemen, this is how the Iraq War started. And it's from this theory that I've noticed how all wars start. You can take any example and apply these things, and you will see that at least three of them have been a part of it. We can do the American Civil War. Civil War, military tensions. The South was very intense with its military, and the North feared them. Nationalists and tribal was fever. The South thought that they had better ideas than the North, and they defended the fact that they're a racist, xenophobic ideology. Great economics with the dash of zeal. South had good trade in agriculture. With that agriculture, they had the appearance that they could do well, even though they didn't have the industry. And finally, the lack of desire for resources. Well, didn't we just mention that they wanted industry? If they took over the country, well, they would get that steel and they would get access to more ports. It'd be a resource win. Basically, not every, every single war is going to follow this formula perfectly. But if you really think hard about it, it's these factors that typically pop up that start a war. At least one will pop up. And it's sad because, like, when you look at them on the surface, they're pretty bad reasons to go to war. They're really not in the good interests of the people. And that's what debaters need to know about war. So before you say that your solution to your speech or that the point of your case that's good is going to war, please think it through. Because sometimes it's not the best means. Moving along. So... Let's go to the choose your weapon. So these are the most common tools to use in warfare. First, we'll go with conventional arms. These are standard firearms, explosives, and ammunition. Firearm industry, interesting, since 2017, has been worth over $398.2 billion. The U.S. providing 50% of sales. And while the U.S. is a big arms supporter, we have very hypocritical arm policies where we can sell arms to countries like Saudi Arabia and they can use them to commit war crimes. 
It's because of this that 70% of Americans are against us selling arms. So that's something that we need to really consider when we talk about the military industrial complex, the essential idea that we make money off of death and war. Then we go to nuclear weaponry. We've discussed this previously, but we'll go over it again. This was developed during the days of the Cold War. Nuclear weapons were originally referred to to be used as full missile systems, but are actually now used in tanks, bombers, and submarines. I think the big example of this is India. India has a lot of nukes, but most of their nukes are not in missile form. They're actually put in lesser amounts, but tucked away in submarines, tanks, and air jets, so that if they do have an attack, it's deadly, but it doesn't destroy everyone. It's just enough so they can wipe out a city or two, or their entire opponent's fleet. Still not good, but that's how India has justified its trifecta of nuclear mayhem. Then we go to chemical and bio warfare. Um, these weapons have been surging in popularity recently. Um, the CSIS, otherwise known as the Center for Strategic International Studies, has found that ISIS has approximately used over 40 chemical weapons since 2014 and is currently developing more. Terrorist organizations such as Al Qaeda, the Taliban, even Al Shabaab are also buying onto this trend. It doesn't help that they've already been trying to hack in for nuclear materials, but now they see that if they just come up with a simple bioweapon or chemical mist that can kill off hundreds of people. It's not only easier to extract from security, but at the same time, it's less expensive and time-consuming to build. This is something that really needs to be honed on in debate, in STEM, in Congress. Really, if you're talking about preventing terrorism or increasing national security, chemical and bioweaponry should be your main talking point. Um, then we move on to autonomous combat systems, or as Obama would dearly call them, drones. Or just any form of military weapons that are programmed with an AI system. These are extremely dangerous as they can easily be shot down to spark conflict. We saw this in the Strait of Hormuz when the US had a drone when had a drone that was down, and then we decided to drown an Iranian drone to see what's happening there. Um, but then it also sparks conflict when they kill more casualties than conventional soldiers. So again, another reason as to why terrorist organizations went after the US and new ones evolved from ISIS was because we sent drones and we killed innocent people. So people who originally didn't believe in terrorism were now like, huh, well, they're going to kill us regardless of whether or not we're terrorists. So, like, let's go fight for our country. Yeah, you killed my brother and I want revenge. It sounds minuscule at first, but understand that these are human beings. And when human beings lose the ones they love, when they lose their homes, they will react. That's why I think that war is a very humanitarian issue. We can look strategy all we want, but at the end of the day, it's how people think and feel. Which leads us to insurgent militias. Um, a common asset in proxy conflicts, these are typically guerrilla groups hired by a foreign government to do their dirty work, or they're a zealous group that aligns with the government, such as Hamas and the Iranian state that we've seen in areas such as Palestine. Um, honestly, these are people that we really should be worried about. The US does use insurgent militias actually in their foreign policy. Um, they're known as the Kurdish rebels. And the Kurdish rebels are good, they have good intentions, but they also have branches that are terrorists and we have to be careful of that. In addition, you really shouldn't just be relying on insurgent groups to get your long-term goal. However, it is a smart play if you are trying to do so in a speech where you're like, what can the U.S. do to stabilize Egypt or to get rid of a leader? You could turn a group of people into an insurgent militia to help fight their war. Now, that is a different, that is a pretty good strategy I would promote. Um, but know that insurgent militias can both be good and bad. I think this is a gray area, honestly. Blockade and resource denial systems. This is by far one of my favorites. I think it's one of the most important. So, otherwise known as area access denial systems. This is a cruel, sometimes a cruel and inhumane strategy. Um, resource denial and blockades are designed to push a group of people to their limit by preventing them access to resources such as food, water, and medicine. However, this is different from area access denial systems. Area access denial systems 
don't block off resources, but rather they block off areas from other military equipment. The U.S. is looking into area access denial systems, and China has been using them. However, when you decide to have a blockade, right, like China's cabbage strategy and the South China Sea, or where China basically takes military equipment and blocks off islands until they surrender or starve to death, and then, of course, you know, you have the Houthi rebels and basically Saudi Arabia blocking off the Hubdaya port and allowing Yemeni children to starve, right? That's inhumane. That's where the line is drawn. But area access denial systems are completely humane in the sense that it's designed to prevent conflict and not promote conflict. I do know we have a slide on that. I just get confused with the wording sometimes. But now that we know what weapons we can use in war, you must be thinking, War sounds pretty bad, but unfortunately, judges like numbers, statistics, and really cool impacts, so in order to get them to listen, we need to dive deeper. So we're going to use a series of case studies, and we're going to take it in chronological order from which these wars have occurred, and I want you to notice the trend. So the first case study is the Spanish-American War, right? This war cost the U.S. $20 million that we had to pay to Spain at the end of it. We lost a total of 4,400 lives, but at the same time, the U.S. did gain Guam, Puerto Rico, and the Philippines. So when we look at this, we think, well, we did gain something, and we only had minor losses. So, yeah, I mean, this seems like war's pretty good, yeah. And in the day, back where this war occurred, it's important to know that there wasn't really any form of international liberal order or government to have negotiations and dialogue. It was really just... I want dominance, and I want land now. So keep this in mind as we move forward. Case study two is World War II. Um, this resulted in over 70 million dead, 44, 400,000 U.S. lives gone out of the 70 million, so we were very lucky. Um, an 8% annual growth rate for the next decade, reason being was that the U.S. just came out of the Great Depression, and because the war required so much industrialization and all of the other countries were decimated with their infrastructure, the U.S. was able to rise as an economic superpower for the first time, really. Um, but this also, its ultimate result in cost was humanitarian disaster in Europe, like diseases, lack of government, starvation, rogue governments. It was just a mess. But... Still, the U.S. survived, right? We engaged in a war. We didn't actually lose much. Maybe not, maybe we lost a little more than the Spanish-American War, but still, it was, it seemed as though war, participating as a superpower, was still enough. Then we move on to case study three, the Iraq War. This resulted in over 400,000 to 600 people dead. The United States lost over $2.7 trillion, and Iraq lost $88.2 billion in the process. The $2.7 trillion that we're seeing there could have been invested into social programs that would have helped prevent the 2008 recession. We were still fighting in this war when we were in debt, when children were starving, when people were unemployed, and our credit system was collapsing. That $2.7 trillion could have helped save lives. Keep that in mind. Furthermore, the $88.2 billion hasn't even been recovered yet in Iraq because they're still having reconstruction. And this is also with the addition of ISIS and other terrorist organizations that are threatening stabilization efforts. Furthermore, when we look at the overall cost and effect of the war, it led to the development of several terrorist organizations and chemical weapons. So now we can look at it through a historical and a contextual lens and say, well, okay, this wasn't a good war, but we made it through, you know, it was a little rough, but surely it can't get worse, right? And that's where we're wrong. Case study number four, the South Sudan Civil War. 400,000 people dead and still, um, they're still counting those injured and still being displaced. Um, it cost South Sudan, 158 billion dollars and 57 billion for the South African, not the South African, but the North African region. 
So the North African region is desperately trying to create infrastructure to help participate and move beyond being rentier states. A rentier state is a state that only relies on oil as its export. These North African states want to get out of debt and they want to have better, more advanced economies. But when $57 billion are being lost to bloody conflicts such as the South Sudanese Civil War, it, that becomes harder. So the overall effect was that it led to a fractured government, widespread violence and cannibalism, rape and crimes against humanity. I would explain more about the South Sudanese War, but I'm not because it was just very gruesome. And it's still going on. Um, it was essentially caused after the new South Sudan government was created. Its constitution called for, and we'll get to how it came to that later on, but essentially said the two main ethnic groups out of 50 were to lead side by side, one president, one vice president. Their ethnic divisions eventually led to a civil war, and since then they have been murdering each other without really regard at this point. Case study five, the Syrian civil war. This happened, um, this started after the South Sudanese war came to fruition. 400,000 people have died from the Syrian civil war and 5.7 million are displaced internally within the country, meaning they're not in a safer place. They are lost within torn down infrastructure and several fighting groups constantly in danger. Um, the war itself costs Syria $388 billion. $388 billion that they can't generate because they don't have the, the banks, they don't have the shops, they don't have the credit lines to just bring up this money, meaning that they're going to be in debt for a long, long time. The end result of this war led to fractured governments, ethnic cleansing of the Kurdish people and the Yahtzee, the proxy interests of various other countries, and chemical warfare. As we're starting to see, war is starting not to have really a win for anyone. And finally, the Yemeni civil war. 230,000 people dead and still counting. 14 million on the brink of starvation or death via cholera. $20 million lost and counting. It has essentially led to a fractured government, ethnic cleansing, proxy interests, crimes against humanity, disease, economic disarray, violence against immigrants, and the list goes on. What we can see from these case studies is that the wars are getting worse. More weapons are being introduced. More interests are being brought to the table. And remember how I said that South Sudan had this constitution written where it decided that these ethnic rival clans were gonna work together without any system of reintegration or dialogue? Guess who signed that in? The United States. Guess who helped escalate the Syrian civil war? The United States. And guess who's still providing Saudi Arabia? The weapons they need to prolong the Yemeni civil war. The United States. Back in the day, the United States fought wars to defend allies and to make a reasonable gain. But as we're seeing from these case studies, that is no longer the picture. We're fighting wars that we do not only gain in, but we're destroying other countries. We're ruining the lives of millions of people. So I ask if you get one thing out of this presentation, know whether you're arguing a case, writing a speech, or giving a congressional dissertation, please understand that when it comes to resolving conflict, the first step that we have to take as debaters is resolving ourselves and getting our foreign policy back where it used to be. We need to start thinking back when we were caring about the international community, not when we were trying to use it for our own gain. That's the biggest thing you need to take away from this. War, it's fun to talk about. I love going over military technology. But it's not fun for the people who are struggling. And that's something that we need to be cognizant of when we debate war in speech and debate.
So this is an interactive map. Um, it shows all the conflicts that the U.S. is engaged in, and it's based on their threat level to U.S. national security. Highly recommend you check it out sometime. And now that we've been through that very depressing segment of the presentation, let's go down in how to resolve war. Or at least prevent it. So. The first step is investing in self-defense technology. Such technology is otherwise known as area access denial systems. If you have territory you want to defend from, let's say, China, these missile systems are equipped only to defend. For more info, read Avoiding War of China by Amida Ayatonsi. It's a very good book. I highly recommend it. The second means of preventing, or at least resolving a war, is peace treaties, international courts, and the global presence. The international community has several organizations and institutions designed to hold actors accountable for war crimes. By promoting such institutions, monitoring programs, and regional-based action conflict, um, and oh yeah, and regional-based organizations, um, and regional-based rather actions, conflict can gradually be resolved. So what does this look like? It looks like basically working with the International Criminal Court to take down a dictator, having organizations in the African Union create a task force to directly deal with the tragedies going on in the Democratic Republic of Congo and South Sudan. What it looks like is having different regions working together with the more developed and international ones so they can have a more layered response. The best way, there is no golden way to solve a war. But if cooperation is stressed and the needs of the local people at the government are both addressed, then you're taking the right step. Finally, aid and development. Oftentimes, poor economic situations allow for the aftermath of a previous war to worsen and allow conditions for a new war or conflict to emerge. To combat this, rural powers need to start investing in regional, local innovation, recovery, and aid groups to kickstart development. A prime example is South Africa. South Africa spearheaded the African Free Trade Agreement, which is supposed to be $4 trillion of revenue every single year, and has already been investing in artificial intelligence to help create a new economy and education system for its people. Sora Mbosa is even trying to make land reparations so that African native farmers finally get access to good land that's been held by the white minority. Essentially, South Africa is taking steps to really develop themselves after the aftermath of their war. But they didn't do it on their own. They're also working with American companies. This is one thing I need to stress. You don't just need the government to pay for innovation. Use public-private partnerships between governments and corporations and international organizations. That's right, BAFTA could do so much good in the developing world and help track and help recover from what can be known as a deadly conflict or civil war. Um, because trust me, there is a light at the end of the tunnel. We just need to be willing to make that reach to get there. Um, right, so moving along, the theories of war. This is important. So if you're an LD, you probably want to listen up. PF, this may be particular. This may be um important to you. Except, I would highly recommend Congress. Not so much, but if you are interested, feel free to listen. The bargaining power of war. The bargaining power of war essentially states that people want to get a gain out of war. So this is why the U.S. engaged in wars like World War II, for example, the Iraq War, right? We want to gain resources and money because we see a gain in war. Then we have realism. The idea that we want to avoid war, but that war is inevitable. So we have allies and we have organizations, but we don't trust anyone to the greatest extent, and we are willing to fight a war if a war does come. Tribalism, which we already went over. Oh, I see I put realism twice. That's great on my part. Please ignore that. Um, the balance of power is different than the bargaining power of war, because the balance of power basically states um, that one would rather have a balance of power than not engage in a war. So it's why, like, the U.S. and Russia have so many proxy wars, right? Back in the Cold War, the U.S. didn't want to have Russia take over the developing world. Thus, they engage in the war simply because Russia was making aggressive actions. Thus, 
the balance of power theory is one of the strongest theories tied to proxy wars. Keep that in mind. And then finally, the Western war theory. If you thought that Donald Trump was doing everything he did without an actual strategy, believe it or not, he's not the first one. The Western war theory is basically this sporadic manifesto where Western powers under manifest destiny can go and conduct war in whatever means and ways they want. And that the whole key to it is to be sporadic and to be whatever rules and centers you want to establish. This is one of the most deadly theories. It led to colonialism. It led to slavery. It led to a lot of nasty things that we'd rather not relive. So if you do want to find a way to identify Trump's foreign policy and his military strategy, the Western war theory is the route to go. So that's all, folks. Um, I hope you enjoyed this lecture. I really wanted to give this because I think that war is one of the most important parts of speech and debate. It's constantly brought up. It's a thing we're trying to avoid. But let's face it, sometimes it happens. But I hope after this lecture, you get a different perspective of war and you see it from different dimensions. Well, I hope you all have a fun time at camp. That'll be all. Good luck.